Hi, and welcome to another episode of Time Extend. My name is Adam Ismail, and I am in a hotel room with... Brendan Rodison, and for the first time in the first podcast ever, we are actually talking to each other face-to-face. Yeah, it's been an interesting night. You showed up a couple hours ago, and uh, I was shocked how tall you were in person. And we immediately went out to go drink, uh, but apparently every bar in where we are in London, which is not actually in London, we're outside London, uh, closes at 11. Yep, um, and now we are back in the hotel room, as we've already specified, <laughs> and we needed something to do. So, congratulations, all of our listeners. There's another podcast to listen to. This would be a great episode if we had a Patreon. This would be a good secret episode. Like, bonus pod. I'm still a little bit... I'm, I'm, it doesn't take much to get me drunk. You're going to learn that very quickly. Good. I'm still a little bit tipsy. So, uh, so yeah. I don't even know what the hell we're going to talk about. Nah, me either. But um, we've got three episodes before with a big <laughs> agenda that doesn't get followed. Um... Let's recall our numerous attempts at trying to pronounce you techniques. Oh that god, was the correct way to that do was it. bad. I'm surprised <laughs> we didn't get cancelled over that. Uh, yeah. So, oh man, so fun things. We're recording this before uh, the night before that we are going to go to Sega's office and play some games, which is going to be a fun time with Alex Easter, who is uh, a very gracious, uh, great host, and yeah, it's going to be a fun week. Uh, I came into Heathrow earlier today, and Brendan, you just showed up a couple hours ago, and then we're going to go up to Glasgow, so, which hopefully will have bars that are open much later than, than here. Yeah, that, that, that's a certainty for sure. Um, <laughs> that will be um, three o'clock in the morning finishes at the very least. Um, finally get... I don't know if you've actually had a bottle of Mad Dog before. I know it's actually... I, I don't know what that is. You don't know what Mad Dog is? I don't is. know what that is. Oh, my days. <laughs> um, but Mad Dog, yeah, that, uh, that's the first drink we'll get you when you get to Scotland there. The name uh, definitely lives up to what it'll do to you. So yeah? I'm what's the, to see that. What's the content? So it's like a fortified wine... Oh, so All right. um, you get like electric melon flavor, um, orange jubilee. If you want to be a bit more formal, it sounds like <laughs> it's gonna change me. It will. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good. <sighs> so it's a shame you you went to the trouble. You bought this PS2 off of eBay with all of these games. I'm gonna finally get to play Shocks. Uh, you don't have it here with you, but even if yeah. you did, we can't plug it into this uh, Premiere in television because we can't yeah. actually move it off of the wall that it's on. Shout out to Premiere in for their incredibly <laughs> solidified TV setup. Clearly, they just don't want people playing shocks in their hotel rooms. That's, that's, a, the, that's, that's definitely why. That's definitely why, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited though. I mean, I feel like... Lots of people uh, in the community have played Shocks because of you, and yet I still somehow <laughs> haven't. I was in a, a retro game shop on Long Island in New York uh, last weekend, and I was looking for a copy of Shocks, and I could not find one. So Yeah, the, the US copy, actually, when you said that, I went on yeah. eBay and had a look, and like the only ones I could find were ones that were still in the wrapping and stuff, and people were like $140. <laughs> Which is funny because I remember when I was a kid, I saw them like in GameStops and stuff like that. But I guess they just didn't stick around. And then there was a GameCube version, the PS2 version, I think. So yeah. I can't find either of them. I mean, the, the US version has that horrible cover. It's bad. It's just yeah. the, the new mini, whereas the other regions definitely got cooler variants. But like you were saying, like obviously people have played it because we've been talking about it almost as a joke. But I also think like. Um, I'm surprised at the amount of people were like, oh, shocks, I played that and it was great. But you would never bring it up in regular conversation because it's if it's an EA Sports big game that was an NBA Street or SSX, then it's just not really talked about that often. Yeah, going to change the subject real quick and just say I looked down and I saw you were wearing Sonic socks. Come prepared, mate. Yeah. <laughs> this is something that would never be possible if we were doing this show in the normal way, so... 
you know, take that as proof that we are in the same room. Uh, and also how bad this episode's going to sound, but that's besides the point. Uh, yeah, I, I, it was always interesting that they, they did the EA Sports big thing to, you know, to shocks with the rallying. It's just not something you would yeah. associate. Like, everyone thinks of SSX, NBA Street. Those are both great games. I love them dearly. Uh, yeah, shocks, though, it slipped me by. It was also the time where there were a lot of kind of random rally games happening like uh rally fusion did you ever play that yeah, one yeah yeah yeah. That, yeah yeah there are all these rally games i feel like came up out of nowhere and they just didn't play any of them which is is on me i mean that's funny because it was one of the first podcast episodes we actually did was talking about how like in the past gen of ps4 and xbox one it's hard to believe we're calling it that already almost um there have been a lot of rally games, but none really that distinct or unique in the sense that they kind of more focus on the generic kind of arcade, maybe Forza Horizon-ish vision of what rally should be. Um, I think in the PlayStation 2 era as well, that was very prevalent because of how successful Colin McRae was. Yeah, I, I played mostly Colin McRae and Rally Sport Challenge. I played a lot, which I feel like doesn't get talked about enough today. Yeah. Do you play a lot of Rally Sport Challenge? It's one of those ones, like, I played it back in the day, yeah. but I definitely owe it to myself to go back. And I think we've talked before, like, in terms of keeping retro consoles, um, my family have really frauded me off in that regard <laughs> in the, the past decade or so, or even further back. So I'm having to buy these consoles back bit by yeah. bit and kind of get back to that speed in Rally Sport Challenge. Um I think um, friend of the show Andrew Elmore is also a massive fan of it. It's so. a really good game. It also it's one of those games that really makes you sad that all Dice is ever allowed to do anymore yeah. is make Battlefield for EA because uh, one and two are both excellent. Two has so much content. There's so much stuff in two. Um, but honestly, like one was the one I fell in love with because I remember I rented it and totally didn't expect anything from it. I'm I, I was a little kid, but like I didn't know any better. And we got the game and it was actually really awesome. And then two just steps up in every way. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's weird because it's kind of like um, definitely not a very it, – it's like a Simcade rally game, which like, yeah. I don't know if there's ever been one of those before. Because Sega Rally Revo feels very – it's very arcadey to me. But Rally Sport Challenge exists in this weird in-between. You also had the – you had the rally cross stages and then you had kind of like the point-to-point rally stages, which they still had even though the game was really not that serious. Yes, there's almost like a kind of drive club of rally. Drive club rally, yeah. yeah. It had a lot of different disciplines, but it actually handled them all pretty well. So that's a game I would definitely go back and revisit, but but you need to play it first. Yeah, exactly. There's, <laughs> there's so much I've got to catch up on. Obviously, Shocks is the outlier for you, but I feel as if there's a whole lot of... Um, a lot of games, even the Project Gotham series, for example, where I feel as if I need to go back and kind of properly play those to appreciate them because it's been so long. PGR is so great, but you've played a lot of MSR. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. MSR yeah. is um, it's it's one of my favorite games on the Dreamcast. Um, the, Jesus, we need to go back to. It's, I mean, <laughs> to me, yeah, we need to do that again. We really should do. You have a copy of MSR. I have one. We should do that next. Um, yeah, MSR. It feels to me if you've played the later games it feels like a pgr beta because there are so many ideas in it that like weren't very good yeah. like <laughs> just it's very it's a very punishing game so like when you crash into walls you lose kudos that's kind of stupid they don't need to do that so like they got rid of that in the future games yeah. and also like the whole thing about how you, like you need to like hold on to cars and if you get rid of them if you sell them and buy another car you lose a, a percentage of the kudos you got with that car it's like, how am I supposed to actually move on in the game if you're imposing these, like, restrictions on me? <laughs> yeah, definitely. And I think um, we were talking about game design and these arcade racers. It's funny how there's, like, a balance between just giving you everything and nothing feels earned. But then there's also the opposite where some games are so stringent and harsh on what you need to do. And um, I think MSR, based on what I've played, obviously not in comparison to PGR because I've still to go back and revisit those. Um, I think MSR is one of the more harsh games in terms of how it distributes the kudos and that type of thing. MSR is very harsh because also like when you when you uh, start the race and you don't finish it, when you don't finish an event, it will subtract kudos for you not finishing the event. <laughs> wow. But it's just like, you know, obviously I'm going to go back and do this again. Like, why are you punishing me because I didn't finish it? Like, it's a very weird game, but then there are also so many weird quirks and bugs 
uh, that actually never made it to U.S. release, so I wonder if uh. they're in the copy you have. It was a very buggy game, from what I understand. So what kind of bugs are we talking about then? Um, certain events were not... You, you like physically could not complete them because because the uh, the goals were set too low, like the times were just unachievable, and as a result of that, certain cars you also could not collect. Jeez. It was really weird. Oh, actually, I'm gonna pull that up because I was uh, <laughs> I, I was at the when I was at the airport earlier today. I was looking this up, and it was pretty amusing. All right, so this is this is courtesy of the Dreamcast Junkyard. Uh, they have a writer there, Tom Charnock, who has done a lot of amazing work to keep the legend of MSR alive. <laughs> so thank you, Tom. I wrote an article for GT Planet a while ago on PGR and cited a lot of his stuff. So uh, it's good. You should go check it out. Uh, so reading down Tom's list of the bucks in this game. Um, completing street race challenges without the required number of kudos will be considered successful nonetheless. The game would sometimes corrupt VM views. Uh, after some time of playing, Tokyo races will always be at night. <laughs> when using a keyboard to enter names, keys were mapped incorrectly. Pressing C would give B, B would give A, etc. The quick race screen in the multiplayer mode would be blank and thus impossible to play. The Alfa Romeo GTV cannot be gained legitimately as the time to beat was set too low at 31 <laughs> seconds. It just goes on and on. And the funny thing is, like, they released several revisions of pgr with bug fixes or uh, msr with bug fixes and they still kept some bugs even though they had fixed some of the higher profile ones there are still some bugs in those other versions so So. strange i wonder if like other teams were maybe involved in the kind of pouring process to the region it was it was a very rushed game and like it seems to me because i've done a little bit of research on it it seems to me like they kind of were under pressure from Sega, although it's never explicitly said because they've had interviews and stuff if you read old Edge magazines about this game and whatnot. Although it's never explicitly said, uh, when MSR came out, like, the Dreamcast was discontinued, like, three months later. So it almost seems like Sega was, like, knew that there wasn't much time left and they were pushing Bizarre, like, you gotta get this thing out. Because, like, (laughs) if, if you don't, like, any chance of success, like, we're running out of time. Yeah, like yeah. it was just like kind of a last minute get out there, and then um, pretty much, yeah. The the machines were stopped. And... Yeah, I mean, it came out in January of two thousand one, I think, in the U.S. And I think it was, I think the Dreamcast was discontinued discontinued in March. So, yeah, there's no time there. I remember the copy that I got had a lot of songs that skipped. I think we actually exchanged it. I think my brother went back to like EB Games or something, exchanged it for a different copy. I don't know if it made a difference or not. So there might have even been like manufacturing issues potentially. Yeah, it's that's, possible. That's a really weird game. I mean, it's cool, but it's very, it's very punishing. And I think we have to be honest with ourselves. Like, I guess you really haven't played the first PGR. Yeah. But yeah. but PGR one's kind of better in every way. It's like everything from MSR, but it has more content and an extra city. So. So you would never really go back to playing, right? Well, unless it's on a dream, cause it's on a Dreamcast, right? That's right? Right? It's a good and like if you like PGR and you haven't played MSR, I don't know if you should buy a Dreamcast for it. But I think it's I think it's worth I think it's worth revisiting because it's an interesting kind of historical piece. But yeah, PGR is is better, and I mean for me, PGR two is kind of like the the peak of that series. Yeah, uh, I need to look into how much. Uh second hand Xbox would actually be for the original PGR and stuff because it's one of those retro consoles actually I've not really looked into in terms of trying to purchase one but I definitely should because I know there were so many games I enjoyed back in the day so it's just a case of going out there and sourcing one yeah the the Xbox has this weird problem from uh, uh, Andrew L. Moore a friend of the show has told me this of like it, it has this like um, capacitor in it that kind of bursts after a certain amount of time and if you don't <laughs> if you don't like yank it out or replace it it will destroy your xbox so wow. that one is my xbox i have not dug inside it and tried to fix that issue but apparently it's something you should be mindful of um i used to get a lot of games on the xbox purely because it was like the most powerful system at yeah. the time like if it was if it was multi-platform i would buy free xbox uh because you you just get in most cases the best version of that game yeah um, except for like Need for Speed Hot Pursuit 2 because 
the PS2 version of that one was better. But <laughs> there were there were lots of little little exceptions to that rule. But for the most part, the Xbox was like the most powerful system. So yeah, definitely, it's, yeah. it's worth a purchase as well, just because obviously Jet Set Radio Future and stuff. So. Jet Set Radio. You had that uh, disc that was Jet Set Radio Future and Sega GT. Uh, was that was that sold uh, here? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I yeah, okay. Like a bundled kind of yeah, yeah. Copy, I do remember that. Two, I mean. I only say GT two doesn't do that much, but like two really good games for for the first year of the system's life, and JSRF, which like you really can't play again unless you have an Xbox. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, that alone's maybe worth put up with a mad exploding ship. <laughs> <laughs> it's worth it's worth giving it a try. Uh, yeah, we really have no game plan for this show. No, but I think I think that's okay. Yeah, I think so. Sometimes it's good to just riff and talk about absolute nonsense. Um, what part of absolute nonsense can we talk about? I'm gonna leave. I'm gonna leave it to you to figure that out because I'm gonna. Yeah. I'm gonna go to the bathroom. That's actually I'll be right a good point. <laughs> <laughs> so am I just to riff for the next like, two minutes? We'll, we'll cut it. We'll cut yeah, it. Yeah, we'll cut it. <laughs> <laughs>
and any sort of weirdness or quirkiness about it, like the soundtrack or Game Over, yeah, was just sort of... <laughs> it was like on purpose but i don't think it was tongue-in-cheek like i don't think they 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 weren't in on the joke because there was no joke yet yeah so like when i see hot shot racer and like they have the announcer that's always talking like this and like they got the sun in the sky and the sun is like an octagon and like the wheels on the cars are just like you know those are like four polygons it's just like uh, like it seems like they're really trying to go too deep into the retro aesthetic which yeah. again for the for the People they're trying to attract, similar to a game that we also kind of are unsure about, uh, Horizon Chase Turbo. Yeah. For who they're trying to go for, that might be good, but like for us, we probably are are reading into it a little bit too much. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the the kind of awkward part in our case because it's like, in theory, this should be something that we are really interested in, but there's like. <sighs> There's an authenticity to it all that has to be adhered to, and if we compare it to a project that's just kind of disappeared off the radar, um, 90s arcade racer. Yeah. So, yeah, like, yeah. when I looked at that, that was a consideration of what made those games great, and the visual style still kind of utilised elements from more modern game design, and mm-hmm. that's why I found it appealing. Yeah. Whereas with this one, it was just a case of watching it, and like you're saying, like, um, Horizon Chase Turbo is loved by a lot of people and I understand why but for me it's just like the kind of the crux of what I don't like about retro throwbacks in the sense that when I play it it's kind of pandering to an era that it expects me to appreciate wrapped in almost mobile game like progression and so right away I just feel as if I'm like secluded from what it's actually trying to hit. Because we've talked before, I didn't play much Top Gear games. I didn't even yeah, know yeah. about the series, really. Um, and, and from what I understand, that's what it's going for. So when I was playing that as a retro racer, it wasn't quite there. And like you were saying, like when Sega were making these games, they weren't trying to throw back to anything. They weren't trying to pay homage to anything. So if we use a modern example of reviving an old series, like Outrun 2, that type of thing, it looked at what made Outrun great. It didn't <laughs> replicate it exactly. Right, it, right. It sprinkled in elements from that era, but Sumo very much put their own kind of... Um, their, their own stamp on that game with the console releases. Yeah. Whereas when I play Hot Shots, for example, I imagine me being like, yeah, that sort of feels like a kind of crafted version of what I did actually enjoy. But right. Yes. So so Sumo is working on Hot Shot. So yeah, exactly. It's so does that give, that gives you faith then? Yeah, to a certain extent, because from what I understand, I've seen a few people talk about the fact that the engine looks distinctly different in this gameplay mm. uh, clips compared to what was before. So there's like kind of uh, murmurs at the moment that it's running on the Team Sonic Racing engine as it stands, yeah. which um, is interesting because <laughs> with that knowledge, if you go back and watch the trailer now, you can actually see the car behaviour very similar. To oh yeah, was there before. Okay. Um, and uh, I guess I preferred to transform. I think we've talked about this right, before. Right. Um, but I mean, that gives me a bit of hope in the sense that Sumo are happy to kind of get on board and push this one over the line very soon as well, apparently, spring release, which is great. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I also feel as if like they had a very distinct vision for what this wanted to be. And sometimes, and I know this might be hard for some people to take, you just got to sit back and say, this isn't really for me. And... I hope you'll yeah, really this, enjoy it. I think it's tough for this particular genre and like the community and these fans because we don't get a lot of arcade racers. Yeah. So it's like when one kind of pops up on your radar and you're thinking like this could be the one and then it's not. It's like, well, I guess I have to keep waiting. I mean, when they did Daytona 3, that, that was kind of my feeling. Yeah. It was just like <laughs> I was so ready to just drop everything and go wherever I could go to play one of those cabinets, you know, out there in the wild. And then once I became aware of kind of what the game actually was, I had no interest in doing that anymore. Yeah. So it's difficult. It is difficult. I mean, that that's the way I also felt about like fast RMX and then fast racing Neo. See, I like those yeah. games though. Those yeah, are, those I are really good them. games. Yeah. yeah. They are fun to play and they're great, but like I went in expecting it to kind of scratch that wipe out itch, but that's not what they're going for. No. And they are fantastic no. games in their own right. Like, I'm still amazed at the visuals they pull off in those games. Yeah. And the speed and the, the consistency of the frame rate are phenomenal. 
But I recognised after playing it, it wasn't trying to hit the points that I really wanted. But see when I started to appreciate it for what it was, then I enjoyed it. And maybe, maybe Hot Shots will be the same. But I, I do fear it might fall into the Horizon Chase Turbo category of, I don't know why I would play this. And that sounds yeah. harsh, but like, I just mean, from my personal point of view, it ticked no boxes in the arcade sector. Mm. Whereas I hope the Hot Shots... The fact it's got online is great um, because even even for us as a community, it would be great to have some form of like stupid arcade racing game to, to kind of play and enjoy. So I think the proof is going to be in the pudding with this one. I think we're going to have to play it and we're going to have to see if we can get over the, the parts of the initial impressions that are kind of putting us off. Yeah. Because who knows, maybe it plays fantastically and then I'll also put it in. It, the physics look good to me when I was watching the video. I mean, it's at the end of the day, my issue with Horizon Chase Turbo is it's trying, it's harkening back to those old like Mode 7 slash Sega Super Scalar Racers. And yeah. like, I just don't, that's not something I really enjoy because the car kind of steers itself to a certain extent. It's just yeah. not what I like. This is a fully 3D <laughs> polygonal <laughs> racing game, so I like that. Uh, the I, I think what's telling is the fact that with this game, another critical comparison between uh, Hotshot and 90s Arcade Racer is like, with Hotshot, they're obviously going for the VR aesthetic. And with 90s Arcade Racer, they were trying to make Scud Race or yeah. Daytona 2 again. Yeah. And it's like, I think that says something because to me, like, you're given, if you're given the choice between playing, you know, in today, uh, a remastered, you know, up to date version of Virtua Racing, or Sega Rally, or Scud Race. I feel like you probably wouldn't pick Virtua Racing no. because, like, it's a good game, and like I was playing it on the plane on the way here when I was coming <laughs> here. Like the Sega yeah. Ages release is phenomenal. I love Virtua Racing; it's awesome. But once you go back to a certain point, it's like you've reached this point where it's like back then. Obviously, you know, they could not realize everything that they wanted to when they were making this game. And, and when you see Daytona, you see Sega Rally, Sega Rally 2, Daytona 2, Scud Race, like they're getting closer to that with each successive release, yeah. with each revision of that Model 2, Model 3 board, they're able to create something that they're that's more in line with the vision they want to create. And so, like, to me, for Hot Shot slash Racing Apex to go back to those VR days, it's like, it seems more to me like they're in love with that aesthetic, but not so much interested in making <laughs> yeah. the best game. I, I and, and maybe that's unfair to say, but it's almost, it seems more to me like a style over substance thing. Yeah, and I think even the, the trailer itself, like, I don't know if you felt the same, there's a few shots that made me feel as if it was more of a, like, a Horizon Chase Turbo type game, like, just the way it would show the car moving like from the behind and stuff, that they weren't really focusing on the fact that it was a full 3D polygonal racer. Um, and if you think about our discussions about virtual racing and stuff, we would always top off pretty much any positive statement with, hopefully this leads on to yeah. Sega Rally, hopefully yeah. this leads on to Scud Race. So like, even from an authentic racer from that generation point of view, being remastered, we're still, we enjoy it because we feel as if it's a, a look into the future of what M2 might actually do. Right. And and I was really excited for, for Virtual Racing because, um, you know, that game had never gotten an authentic, you know, arcade perfect port before. I mean, this is obviously on the Switch, it's beyond arcade perfect. So this was the first kind of justice that like VR had ever been done. Yeah. We got that with Daytona in 2011 on the Xbox. We got that with... Um, well, we, we haven't really ever gotten it with uh, Sega Rally outside of the PS2 release with Sega Rally 06. So, like, I feel like there are other games that, that still need, that deserve that kind of treatment. Um, so, you know, I mean, with, with Hot Shot in that case, they may have been sort of, I don't know how Virtual Racing Sega Ages did, but the fact that that game came out may have sort of made them more enthusiastic about the potential commercial aspect of releasing this game even though it's still at the end of the day niche arcade racer yeah exactly and it's great to see sumo continue to get involved in these types of game because if we were ever disillusioned that maybe they were just interested in the sonic element of the racers after the outrun kind of phase and the sega rally online arcade phase i think this kind of 
puts that belief to bed almost in the sense that sumo really like these racing games and if they're giving the, given the chance to get involved they, they seem to take it up every time so um, it gives me hope that one day sumo will get the chance to make or get involved in a racer that is a bit more distinct and kind of maybe bridges away from the homage type territory into something new because we really need that we need that like next hot arcade racing game that isn't just going to be based on something we've already had let's be honest yeah it's a shame that sumos kind of always exist in the space where they could make these games for other publishers and stuff but they, they can never make a game that they can put out yeah, themselves exactly. like I mean, hey, Forza Horizon 2 on the Xbox 360, <laughs> which was we f- totally forgot about. I mean, they made that game. Like, yeah. it's uh, it's amazing for, for a developer with clearly so much love and interest and, in, like, keeping that tradition alive. They can't – it's a shame that just the way the financials work, like, they just can't put something out there themselves because you wonder what that game would look like. Yeah, exactly, because they clearly have a passion for it if they're able to put their own stamp on games that probably have very stringent kind of requirements of what it should play like, what it should look like. It would be really cool to see like a sumo arcade mega mix or something where yeah. they just like go all out with the, the bits that they love about these arcade racing games and then um, get freed in to kind of put their own stamp on it because clearly they've got the, the personnel who really want to do that um, or so it seems. And it's something that we'd really like to see as well. Yeah, I almost wonder why Sega doesn't lean on them more to to bring some of these games back. Just because they're so good at it and like there are so many properties that they could probably... <laughs> I mean, we know there are so many properties that they could sort of mine through uh, to bring back. And Sumo, I think, would be the, the appropriate choice in like every case. Yeah, it's, it's an iterative process at the end of the day. Um, the more success that Sega see working with Sumo maybe the more kind of stamp they can put on it um, but it's a relationship yeah. that's gone back so long I mean sure. yeah. you know Outrun 2 came out I think it was Xbox uh, in 2004 yeah. um, and since then you know we're talking 15 years it's up until Team Sonic Racing last year yeah exactly so. and I mean that that's probably one of the longest standing kind of outward relationships Sega's had with a studio that they yeah. don't directly own. I mean, them in Sports Interactive that do the Football Manager games, that's like the, the two main studios they collaborate with a lot that they don't right. have internally. And um, yeah, I mean, maybe it's time for Sumo and Sega to, to think of the next Sega Rally or Daytona or something. I mean, maybe that that's just us that really wants that. <laughs> yeah, but I'm not sure what kind of guys that would have nowadays. But I mean, I, I don't know if you agree, Adam, but the blueprints there with the the kind of the Sega specific, sorry, the Japan um, exclusive Sega World Drivers Championship. Sega World Drivers, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's right there. Come on. <laughs> Which some people on our Discord have said uh, have been fortunate enough to play that game. Uh, in Japan, and they're not very keen on it. It's interesting, isn't which it? Which is because disappointing, yeah. We see it through our eyes at the moment <laughs> of the, the holy grail that we've not been able to experience. Yeah. But, I mean, I would still love to play it like that. That's you were you were gonna have your <laughs> chance this year, and now you. Oh God. <laughs> yeah, I mean, literally going to Japan in May, and that's probably up in there now. So clearly, I'm just not destined. To yeah. Play. Yeah, WDT. maybe one day, <laughs> maybe one day. But hey, on on the way here, I saw the Outrun Two cabinet in yeah. Heathrow. That was pretty awesome. You came across the Sega Rally Three cabinet. We're gonna apparently go to an arcade at some point that has a Ridge Racer, which I I've never played Ridge Racer in the arcade before, so it's a it's a big deal. Yeah, yeah. I've I've played Ridge Racer too. Yeah, arcades. I've never played the original. Yeah, so uh, that's gonna be exciting. So we're actually gonna be able to tick off like three cabs in the space of a week. Oh my god. Run. Uh, Sega Rally Free and Ridge Racer. Stuff. It's so funny too because like I, I it's hard to convey uh, if you're listening to this and you are American or I assume Canadian, you, you're aware of this, but like it's hard to convey how prevalent Daytona USA is in American arcades. <laughs> like yeah. you, I would say it is present more often than it isn't. Like if you were, whether it's a barcade or you know just a regular old arcade, like there's probably a 70% chance that it's going to have a Daytona USA cab. I'm going to have like at least a two or a four player one. Like it's, yeah, it's pretty awesome. But at the expense of that, like 
there aren't really any other arcade racers that circulate sure. on the continent. Like, there's no Sega Rally. There's no Ridge Racer. Scud Race I used to see. I haven't seen a Scud Race cabinet <laughs> in, I think, like, seven or eight years. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, like, it's the opposite here. Like, Sega Rally was the big driver. Daytona was the companion piece. Yeah. Like, people would know the Daytona theme because it would just blare out in the attract mode. Um, they would try to play it, as you've probably seen from me on that live stream, and not quite understand the dynamics. But when it came to Sega Rally, like, I'm not kidding when I say, like, the majority of family members in my family at one point knew how to beat Sega Rally, including the Lakeside stage. Because yeah. it was just so prevalent. Like, you would have competitions to see who could beat it the quickest. It wasn't a case of making Lakeside. It was a case yeah. of who could do it Who could quickest. do it fastest, yeah. And, um... Some of us can't do it at all. <laughs> 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 and with the Namco racers, like, Ridge Racer wasn't actually that prevalent here either. Hmm. But a lot of Namco's weird later racing games with, like, the Mario car uh, kind of crossovers yeah, and one gun the, the whatever f- yeah the yeah. photograph racers they were everywhere over yeah. here but Ridge Racer just wasn't really it was mostly like yeah. Spain and Greece and stuff you'd see those cabinets from my experience anyway I think I saw a movie theater that had like it was right shortly after these games came out it was second tag and then also Ridge Racer oh. 5 arcade battle Ridge Racer 5 Arcade Battle, now that yeah. does ring a bell. I've definitely yeah. seen a cab for Ridge Racer 5, but I couldn't recall where it's been, but I've yeah. definitely seen it. Um, one of the weirder cabs that I've seen over here in the UK that was really popular, actually, um, was Virtua Tennis. I'm not sure yeah, I, I've seen a Virtua, yeah, I've seen a Virtua yeah. Tennis cab. Um, yeah, there was this arcade that was fine. They had that, and they had this other game. They had this, like, uh, Jalico arcade racer called Speed Up that actually wasn't bad. Yeah. Or it wasn't Jalico, it was Galico. They're like these two companies that sound almost exactly the same. But anyway, uh, not bad. But yeah, Virtua, Virtua Tennis is really cool. And just also one of my... Uh, a series that doesn't get enough credit. Because, Agreed. yeah, I'm not even a massive tennis fan. I've been playing Virtua <laughs> Tennis my whole life. Many people were before Virtua Tennis. <laughs> like, um, I think that's one of those series is that was doing really well. And then, um, obviously this is my personal opinion... But um, when 2009 came out, they shifted to that yearly name and then also nullified the gameplay a bit to be more realistic. I think they kind of missed what made Virtua Tennis great and tried to go after like, the top spin dollar, basically. They felt as if that was a better business model going forward. But the truth of the matter was that Virtua Tennis was so great because, I mean, maybe this is slightly controversial, but... Tennis video games for me kind of have to be arcade in nature because they're a bit monotonous in a sim yeah. kind of way to, I mean obviously there's going to be enthusiasts that love it Um, shared a few funny screenshots from the Steam forums when AO Tennis 2 came out and there was these guys talking about like AO Tennis as if it was like Gran Turismo versus Forza they were mm. like so like critical about the way the spin shots worked and stuff but I think the majority of people really just want that Virtua Tennis arcade gameplay yeah, because at the end of the day, it's glorified pong. I mean, and, and you can't, exactly. and you're not, and you're not running. You're not physically doing these things. So I think one of the the beautiful things about Virtua Tennis Three was that, like, yeah, you only ever had in Virtua Tennis so Three you could do the you could do the regular shot, the lob, the slice, and that was really all, all you had. And your success or failure with each of those shots would be dependent on your movements and the way you were running and moving before you took the shot. So like if it's out of your range, you're diving. Well, I mean, that's not good. You don't want to do that. If you're squared up better, you'll have a better shot. It's just that it's that, you know, thing we talk about with arcade racers a lot where it's just that it's just that these games aren't very technically complicated, but there's still a depth to them. They're very, in terms of the things you have to worry about your physical inputs, there's not much there, but it's how you, how you weigh those things, how you manage them, and how you're able to, uh, how careful you are with your inputs that determines your success, not how many inputs you have to manage at one time. Exactly, yeah, and I think that sums it up because um, the thing you're saying about the dive shots, for example, Virtua Tennis 3 particularly, um, was fairly gracious in the window that you could hit dive shots, so you could have some fucking hilarious matches where the players were just diving back and forth (laughs) and no rally would ever end. But even that was still fun, whereas um, Top Spin, for example, I always felt as if um, being so critical and harsh about a game like tennis just took away the fun for me because... Mm. 
I know I'd be shit at it in real life. So, like, <laughs> playing a game of tennis and being reminded of that when I'm playing as Roger Federer and that type of thing, it's just, it misses the mark. And, like, we talk about with rally games, like, sure, not everybody can beat Sega Rally, but you'll have those moments when you feel like a genuine rally driver because of the way the physics are created. And it's the same with Daytona. When you learn how to drift, it's an incredibly satisfying feeling. Even if you don't know how to drift to maximise your time, yeah, you still look good playing. And that's the main thing. Yeah, and I think the thing about Sega Rally 2 that always strikes me is that there's no... Like, in Daytona, there's a point where you get, you're get you in a drift. Like, you're locked in the drift. Yes. In OutRun, you're very sort of restricted. <laughs> and that's, that's yeah. the thing I don't like about OutRun, too, honestly. Uh, in Sega Rally, it's all very, it's always in flux. It's always yeah, dynamic. It's you're Sometimes yeah. you're you're kind of sort of losing grip. Sometimes you're not. And it's just like, you don't, you know, if you're, try to put yourself in the shoes of just a person who's never played this game before. It's like, you don't have to worry about or even be cognizant of the fact that it's like, oh, the game now is considering that I'm going sideways and I have to do these things to stay in the drift. It's just like, yeah, it's, it's what you're saying. It's very natural. Because, like, I was playing OutRun 2. We were just talking about this before we did the show. And I was playing OutRun 2 in the airport today. I'd never played an OutRun 2 cabinet before. Yeah. So I'm playing this game with a wheel for the very first time in my life. And I'm just like, I don't like this. Because, like, <laughs> yeah. it's the wheel means two totally different things before and after you're in the drift. Before you're in the yeah. drift, you barely turn. Afterwards, it's like you have to go crazy on it left and right. And it's just, it just seems like there are two kinds of physics in games like that. There are physics where you have grip and physics where you yeah. don't. And what I love about Sega Rally is that the, 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 that line is blurred. It doesn't really exist. Yeah, I think you're 100% correct. And when we talked about the Ridge Racer games, for example, they definitely went down that route of like, this is how the car handles normally, which is barely. <laughs> this is in a drift where you can do whatever the fuck you want, like 360 360 spins yeah, corners yeah. and stuff. You can have a gate laugh. But um, yeah, Sega Rally and it, it it makes sense for the discipline it's representing. It's more about shaving those kind of milliseconds off and the series as a whole kind of carries that forward as its mantra, although slightly um, implemented differently across each version. 95 still hits the sweet spot as far as I'm concerned but um, there aren't many arcade racers I would say with as much depth as Sega Rally when it comes to the handling model because it's one of those games where you might accidentally go into a corner slightly different but then you realise like oh my god I just shaved like two seconds off my time there yeah. purely because I shifted midway through a corner or the most obvious one that everybody's probably still trying to get right to this day um on the the mountain circuit like that that hairpin yeah really tight corner yeah yeah it's yeah. like how am I supposed to do that everybody yeah, yeah. kind of has their own mechanism if you watch people play everybody tackles it slightly different mm. and it's interesting because even when I watch people online I'm like I should try that way of taking that corner I go I'm not going to do that it just seems <laughs> if it's pointless <laughs> but love too is like when you're younger and you're playing that game you see the computer do it and you're like how are they doing because literally like Jolting. they don't they don't turn like the card doesn't actually change direction it's just it's going one way one way and it stays facing the same direction but now all of a sudden it's going right yeah, yeah. that is pretty funny actually when you see that it's like the most annoying thing and I think as well, when you emulate like the arcade versions of the game, you see that all, all the cars basically have yeah. that coded in the way they turn. On the, the arcade cabs, I don't know how they mask it, but it looks a bit more natural. But when you emulate it, like there must be something missing because the cars yeah. don't look natural. At it, all. it probably has something to do with the resolution. I think, yeah, you know, it's, it's just so much sharper when you can play it on your computer or something compared to back in the yeah. day. But because there's that like funny glitch that happens where like um, the car that's ninth on desert will randomly like, fly into to the sky yeah yeah come back there from the helicopter <laughs> and it's like one of those weird glitches i think everybody's seen it at least once when yep. playing i've always wondered what causes that yeah it's funny too in that game when just when cars drift and they just pick up on like two wheels you know it happens a lot <laughs> yeah. and there's like it's a very hard thing i don't think it's really technically possible for you to do that with the player's car in that game nah. yeah no, I they're like kind of glued to the ground except except that when they all you know when all four wheels leave but yeah the yeah. Celica is probably the, the closest car that can go up on that two wheels. Yeah, it's yeah. It's a bit longer, but like the Delta is absolutely like... 
stuck to the road, but we always end up talking about Sega Rally. It yes. always comes back to Sega Rally. Yeah. I mean, it's obviously your uh, safe to say your your number one. Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah, um, ninety five is just. I think it's appropriate for this show because we. There's no agenda, and it's literally just... <laughs> Didn't know what else to do, and we were a little bit drunk, so we are like, why not? Yeah. Um, but Maybe we should just pick out a list of about 10 company names that are really difficult to say and see how... I don't think I want to do that. I don't think I want to do that again. <laughs> yeah. I love how you've, you've like clung on to that, and I'm trying to forget. I was honestly unsure if I should cut that out of the show. <laughs> It's funny though because like it's not in any ep- oh, wait, it's actually one of the episode descriptions I just realised yeah yeah <laughs> so it's like people about to find it anyway but I just I like the idea that it's just like 20 seconds of an episode that's been lost to the ether it's, a, it's on that it's on that cusp between like is this going to offend somebody and also it's pretty funny that I can't pronounce it correctly <laughs> um yeah go listen to that uh yeah that's probably a good place to end it I think yeah, right, we've, right. Got, we've got a lot of recording time coming <laughs> yeah, up, exactly. so like we don't want to exacerbate everything, and then we've got nothing sure. to talk about. It's a short show, and I'm honestly impressed that we made it 45 minutes. I only had to go to the bathroom once, so. Yeah, I mean, the only reason we're literally recording this is because London throttled us off Yeah. By shutting their pubs so early. Yeah. Even the hotel bar. Like, Even the hotel bar, really disappointing. Yeah, that, that's Yeah, better. and the dominoes across the street is starting to sound better and better. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I wonder, I mean, it's 20 to 1. It'll so probably open at like midday or something, though, what we've got here. Yeah. All right. Well, once again, thanks for listening uh, to this show. I, I hope that it, whatever expectations you had for it, it wasn't too far off the mark. Uh, and yeah, you'll hear from us again soon. Cheers for listening, guys.